spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing. Well, happy Monday and happy Valentine's Day to all of you tuning in here this morning. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. We hope that you are all recovered from your Super Bowl celebrations, and so great to see so many of you starting off your week with us this morning as we catch up with the Lieutenant Governor on a number of issues this morning, Yanji. That's right. He's not only the lieutenant governor, he is now officially a candidate for governor. We're going to talk about some state issues and, of course, his campaign as well. Good morning, Dr. Green. Good morning and happy Valentine's Day to you guys and to Jamie and to Maya and Sam. <laughs> uh, we want to get straight to the COVID case counts, as we often do when we start talking to you. Uh, great to see that the numbers do appear to be going down. How do you think we're doing when it comes to combating the, the virus right now? We're doing very well. We're down to 498 cases today of Omicron. Our active case counts 11,785. That is a significant drop. That's an 80% decline from our peak, which occurred on January 21st, three weeks ago. So 80% down. Also, our hospital numbers are down more than 52%. They peaked at 393 individuals in the hospital. And as of today, we are at 170 acutely sick people, and then 192 if you add incidental cases. So the case counts have been dropping really precipitously, 17 people in the intensive care unit, 11 people requiring ventilators, and these are gigantic decreases from before. But, you know, your heart breaks when even one person is that sick. What does this all mean? Well, this means that our case counts not only are dropping, but we will soon be able to get back to our normal lives much more than we have been for a long time. You're probably thinking, what does that specifically mean? And that means that sometime in March, we should be able to begin to move away from the safe travels restrictions. And the last thing that will likely go will be the mask mandates. States all across the country are now getting rid of their mask mandates, but we're being a little bit more careful. And in discussions with the director of health today, we did describe uh, that as the last thing to likely go. Well, let's talk a little bit more about safe travels as well as these other programs that have been, or, you know, uh, um, I guess restrictions that have been put in place, such as those requiring vaccine verification or negative testing. Uh, when do you think that those types of requirements will um, no longer be valid? I mean, you had mentioned safe travels, uh, but how long do you think people will continue to need to show, say, a vaccine card to get into a restaurant? And, and when would we see maybe the sunset of some of those things? My recommendation would be mid-March at this rate. I don't want to ever reduce restrictions if it means people could get sick. But let me um, give you some more kind of perspective. Right now, 7% of all of our hospitalizations are COVID related. So that's 7% out of 2,393 people in the hospital are there for COVID. When we reach the threshold of 100 people total in the hospital for COVID, we will be at 4%. And that's an utterly low number. Even California has a much more, um, I guess, relaxed approach to getting rid of these restrictions. So we're getting there quite quickly. And so when we're consistently under 100 for seven days, that makes a lot of sense. We should be under 100 people in the hospital sometime in the next seven to 10 days. So we can start moving that way. After all, people do have to get on with the rest of their lives. And there are consequences of lockdowns and restrictions. It's very difficult for people, uh, especially if they run a business. That's important to us in Hawaii so we can pay our rent and pay for our kids' tuitions and so on. Pay for Valentine's Day cards and candy. I mean, anything to get back to normal. So I think the analytics will describe where we go with that, but I would not be surprised uh, if that's when it happens. I can tell you, I did some research with my team this morning, states all across the country, I'll, I'll even tell you, it's like California, February 15th, reducing some of their mandates, even on masks. Connecticut, February 28th. Delaware, uh, February 11th, a couple days ago. Illinois, February 28th. Mostly it's uh, February Oregon's looking at March. So as long as we have the lowest counts in the country, that's good. We actually now have moved back to the position of having the lowest mortality rate uh, below even Vermont. So we're the lowest of all 50 states. But we don't want to see a resurgence of this disease, and, and we want to be careful. 
Right, and some of the comments here are wondering why we would drop restrictions given that there are variants on the horizon, including, I think it's called BA2, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but this sort of sister of Omicron, if you will, or, or new rendition of it. So given that there could be another variant along the way, one of the concerns is that when you take something away, like a mask mandate or a safe travels, you lose that infrastructure and it's very hard to get people to go back. What do you say to people who are concerned that we loosen our guard or, you know, lessen our guard and then these variants come in? A couple of things. Uh, yes, BA2 is a subvariant of the current Omicron variant. It's not very different. It's got 20 mutations on the spike protein, uh, but it is uh, a less severe less severe variant, putting far fewer people in the hospital. I would say a couple things. We don't want anyone to be unsafe, but there will be variants for the next several years. And no one is suggesting, I don't think even the most um, most conservative individuals that might be writing on Facebook, that we would stay uh, in lockdown or keep rules like safe travels in place for the next two, three, four years. That's not feasible. Also, from a practical standpoint, and I just want to be very direct, uh, we are going to lose federal funding on or around April 1st. And on March 17th, our National Guard support will begin to go away because they have to begin to be redeployed. So much of that is the infrastructure to provide support. Now, we're already the lowest in the country, and we're not going to stop providing health care. We're not going to stop providing testing. We won't suddenly say that you shouldn't wear masks ever. Of course, we will say that. In fact, as a health care provider and the director of health uh, by my side, I'm sure we'll continuing to recommend that people wear masks if they're high risk, if they're unvaccinated, if they're in large gatherings. Good health guidance has always been what carried the day. So we'll do that. But when you get down to a place where very few of the hospitalizations are related to this disease, there's no uh, rationale for staying in lockdown. And again, I'll say this, the consequences of kids not being in school was very difficult and catastrophic in some cases. The consequences of people being unable to have their lives uh, in order meant that there was extra depression, there was extra self-medication and drug addiction. These are other consequences that result from isolation and rules. So I think that the mayors and the governor will make those final calls, but I will give them the analytics uh, when we know that we're in a pretty safe space. You know, some are wondering how we went from possibly including a booster shot into the requirements for things such as safe travels, as well as for programs like Safe Access Oahu uh, to be able to get into establishments, uh, not only being you know, having that vaccination, but also counting the booster shot as a fully vaccinated individual to enter into these types of establishments or to include that into safe travels. Uh, how we went from that uh, conversation to now lifting everything, you know, within a few weeks, uh, is it because of where we're at now? And and how, what is the state's plan, I guess, moving forward to encourage boosters uh, as we move through this uh, next year? Most of the data, like I said earlier, we peaked at 58,521 cases on the 21st of January, and we're now down uh, under 12,000, so we're 80% off of peak. So Omicron, as we knew, was eventually going to burn out, and it did, and that's why. So that's why the governor ultimately decided when you have a state that's at about 36, 37% fully vaccinated plus the booster, uh, you can't imagine that 63% of the people would not be able to do A, B, C, or D in society. That's just not feasible. Another good piece of information for you to have is that of the population over 65, so our kupuna, or actually 65 year olds aren't very old, but if we're describing individuals as older and more vulnerable over 65, 72% of them have already had the booster. And that's the most protection that you can really offer right now. So it's really the case counts plummeting, the hospital numbers plummeting, and all the rest of the world going to a position that is less restrictive. So we have to be smart about things. We cannot be reactionary. And Hawaii, like I said earlier, has done better than any other state as far as fatalities. I think we're second best in the world, I should say country, uh, for case counts and case rate. So you just have to be nimble. And that's what two years on this job has taught me. You know, we've been on an amazing journey together, my team and the state. and. There have been ups and downs. There's no question about it. But for the most part, our policies have really kept us safe. And so we're continuing use, to use analytics to make sure we're safe going forward. When do you think we should lose masks for kids in school? You know, I asked this as a mom. My daughter is five. She's vaccinated. I would love it if her friends could see her full face and if she could see their faces. But I also have concerns because I have an unvaccinated three-year-old at home. So how are we figuring this out, particularly when it comes to kids in school? Well, that's based on the case rates also. One of the challenges is children between age six months and uh, their fifth birthday 
can't get vaccinated. And that's been postponed at least until April. So they would be more vulnerable to catch COVID, although the severity of their disease is really low. We've had a very small number of individuals get sick and go to Kapiolani for care from COVID. I've treated two children or three children, three children uh, with COVID that were under age five, and they weren't that sick. They had upper respiratory symptoms, kind of cold-like symptoms, runny nose. They're basically okay. I think that we're going to come to a place in the spring where COVID is uh, not, just not so severe, not nearly as severe as the Delta variant uh, was for us. So I think that's the time at which we'll get rid of some of the mask mandates. It's hard to mask little kids. Also, age five to 11 year olds are pretty, um, they're pretty well on their way with vaccinations. They were hovering around 40% and our adolescents are very well vaccinated. They're almost 75% fully vaccinated now. So you can see as we get older, we've got more people getting vaccinated and protected from catching COVID and spreading it. When we, when we hit the spring, when we're really deep into spring, I think you're going to see that most things go back toward normal. Not too normal, but toward normal. Another thing that was big for you last week was that you officially entered the governor's race. I mean, there was really a lot of surprise there. We knew that this was something that you had talked about, that you had been building with your campaign, but making it official last week. Uh, there was also a recent poll that came out in the Honolulu Star Advertiser uh, that clearly shows that you have the advantage well, in terms of fundraising as well as just uh, the overall percentage points. Your thoughts uh, on the poll and just as you enter this uh, race and this uh, campaign for governor officially begins. Sure. Well, thank you for asking. I'm flattered. It's very humbling to have people support you and to be so kind to, to me and my family. And I appreciate it. I will not take it for granted. Given the circumstances that we've been witnessing these last couple days and weeks, I think it's more evident than ever that we need leaders who we trust and who care about people. I believe that the reason the poll is pretty good is because we've been really on an adventure together, a, a true adventure where the people and me have gone up and down through COVID and we've had to really wrestle with issues in our families. And so people have been in my living room with my family, with me and you guys talking about these issues. But more than ever, I think that I've built up some trust with people. And I'll, like I said, I'll never take that for granted. But that's why I'm running for governor, because we need leaders who we can trust and who care about us. Uh, one of, you know, the race has gotten a lot of speculation. Kai Kahele, congressman now, uh, has sort of dipped his toe into the race, saying that he's considering a run. Uh, what are your thoughts about him and the other people who are running against you? I think there are there are good traits in all the other candidates, honestly. There always is something good to see in people. I would say that about the lieutenant governor candidates also. Just always a good um, personal trait or a strength that each of them have. All I can do is, uh, you know, present myself well and and present my family well and lead by example. But I, I really do think trust and caring is going to be critical to this race because of what we've gone through with COVID. And also because of what we've seen this last week, there's been an erosion of trust in public officials. And I think that that's a tragedy. If I'm chosen to be governor, I will not stand for any corruption in my administration, period. And that has to be absolutely clear. So the public trusts us to take on big issues, whether it is COVID or Red Hill uh, or so many other things, honestly, rebuilding our public health system, taking on homelessness. We've got to build houses for people. These are the real issues. So I don't dwell on other candidates running. If people end up choosing me to be governor, it will be the honor of a lifetime. One of the things that we spoke to the congressman on this program last week, uh, one of the things that he did uh, that maybe sparked this conversation was release a 10 point plan on COVID-19 that was very critical of the administration and the way that um, you know the administration has handled, especially this recent Omicron surge, saying that the state was not prepared for Omicron. It didn't have the mask, the testing, uh, or, or really the infrastructure, just a patchwork of rules and regulations to protect the, the people of Hawaii. Uh, and so the congressman released this plan of his. What is your take on that criticism and the plan that he put forth? Well, the suggestion that there wasn't a plan is completely wrong. Um, here, this is a massive plan that we've been working on for months and months and months. And uh, anyone who's been a, a Monday morning quarterback hasn't spent any time, not a single time on any of the meetings with us. 
And I would just say this, it's an honor to have been a part of a response where we vaccinated 1.1 million people. No other state did that at that rate where we've had over 500,000 people get boosters, where we have the lowest mortality rate in the country. I'm not sure what someone else would want better than that, but it's a heartbreak to see anyone die, uh, to see anyone get sick. You know, on the weekends, I'm on call. I'll be on call this coming weekend. I will undoubtedly see someone who's sick with COVID uh, or others who want vaccinations, and I'll do it myself to get them vaccinated. But uh, in general, people like to make criticisms when they're involved politically. I'm not into that. I don't think it's appropriate because there's so much work that's been done by hundreds and thousands of people to keep our kupuna and other people safe. And Hawaii should be proud of its response overall. We have done more than any other state in the country by far to keep our people safe and healthy. I want to ask you, you referenced the corruption scandal that's unfolding at the legislature. Uh, there's a lot of people who throw their hands up and just feel disgusted with politics altogether. Uh, this was some very blatant corruption happening, but there's a big article in today's paper that talks about sort of a more subtle area of influence where there are people who donate you know, above board um, and perhaps expect something in return. What do you think about the system is as it is overall? And what do you say to people who are watching who just say they're all corrupt and I don't want any part of it? I feel for them because I want them to trust their their lieutenant governor and their governor and their senators and their rep. Um, people have trusted me because I'm a doctor and I think everyone knows that. They see me walking around in my scrubs. They see me on call. That's always been where I've been uh, as a person. So when I say lead by example, I think having another skill set and other, you know, other ways to serve is important. It may be why I stand out from others. I don't know the gentleman who was involved in that, that scandal. I know he gave donations to all kinds of people. Certainly wasn't me. And so all I can say is I will do what I can if I serve as governor to restore trust uh, and faith in government. I still will be very heavily focused on the private sector, too, and, and do a lot of things in partnership with them. I like humanitarian missions like you saw when we went to Samoa and that was all private sector support. So those people felt a commitment from a uh, public servant. We went out and helped people. You lead by example, you restore trust, but it is a tragedy. It's horrible. I actually consulted with uh, one of our former attorney generals who I have a lot of respect for uh, this morning, even uh, Marjorie Bronster, who's supporting my candidacy for governor. And she, you know, was helping to educate me on how you root out corruption and how you have a channel of communication so people can speak up and give testimony on this matter without political interference. That's the kind of thing that I will make sure we focus on uh, if I end up serving as your governor. But probably it's a good time to have someone who's a bit of a kind of outsider as far as profession goes. And that has been an honor to serve as a doctor all these years. That is a difference. But you know what? I. I think that government has always been in question uh, going way back. There have been era after era after era where former administrations were, were doing funny business and that's not okay. So we should be above all that. Honestly, the real things we have to deal with are building houses, making sure it's affordable to live in Hawaii. In other words, get rid of the tax on like medicine and food, deal with homelessness once and for all and get some new industries in here so we have a vibrant economy. Not all this, um, funny business that goes on at the Capitol. So uh, I'll root that out if I have the opportunity, but I've you know done what I can to stay above it all these years. I want to ask a little bit about, you know, that issue of affordability and living in Hawaii. You know, Hawaii uh, has, the, has had the highest rate of population decline per capita in the United States, and we're seeing it even more so after the pandemic. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, low unemployment numbers, and yet this high demand for workers in a variety of fields you know, how do we solve this labor issue, if you will, with so many people leaving the state because it is not, uh, you know, they just they say it's too expensive and it's too hard to make a living here uh, and, and also support the businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19 that are struggling to get workers to fill these positions? Uh, there are a few things, and that's a pretty complicated question, but I appreciate it. Uh, first and foremost, you can decrease the cost of living uh, with some direct changes. And I mentioned it earlier. We, and I've sponsored this piece of legislation before when I was in the Senate and the House, we should not be taxing uh, basic food supply and we should not be taxing medicine. That could put at least 500 bucks uh, per year and back into people's pockets, which would make some small difference, but not a big difference. We have to have a housing supply and it's gotta come fast. We should really crack down on illegal Airbnbs. So we put those rentals back into the market and decrease the price point to rent here in Hawaii. 
We have to build like heck and we have to support Hawaiian homelands. Supporting Hawaiian homelands with the appropriation, which I do appreciate, that was recommended uh, earlier this session by some of the legislators, I think the speaker, that's also very important because that means more people can have affordable houses. But let's go to some big things. A true livable wage, a true livable wage would make a huge difference. I've sponsored legislation on that before. I will sign that bill if it comes to me. I support it completely. If you look at the studies, a true living wage is about $21. That's the MIT study. We'll have to get there gradually. Right now it's $10.10, which is completely inadequate. What I think they'll do is they'll move to 15 and then likely $18. Most businesses are already paying that. So really decreasing the cost of living is gonna be the best approach because more than not, even small businesses are already paying $18 or more. And then finally paid family leave. We have to make it attractive to live in Hawaii. A lot of people have their children uh, sometimes when they're young here, but they have to be working one or two jobs. If you don't give people paid family leave, they have to lose those jobs. And if they lose those jobs, they can't afford their rent. So that's about five things that I think that I will fight for and I'll do personally. But there's a lot of other things that can be done. And if you get more industry here and you bring in a lot of extra economic growth, then you have a better and broader tax base and you have less difficulty keeping people here. Let's talk a little bit about Red Hill made a lot of news last week, the congressional delegation coming out in force saying that they're going to introduce legislation to drain the tanks uh, from that angle, the Navy uh, through the Pentagon, uh, pursuing two lawsuits to stall the Department of Health's order to de defuel that whole facility. Is there any scenario where you think that the existing tanks can be used as a fueling facility, let's say if they're double walled or if the Navy makes assurances, uh, or does that need to be gone, period, the end? Where do you stand on that? They would be better used as flowering pots at this point. So uh, look, let me be absolutely clear on this. The tanks have to be drained the fuel has to come above ground and it has to be done immediately. We must drain those tanks. Our water and our health have to come first. There's no question. And I want to be even triply clear here on this. On December 2nd, I said Red Hill contingency option. I sent this over to the governor. Remove the fuel from Red Hill. Work with PAR Hawaii. Here's a diagram that we sent them on the 2nd showing how PAR Hawaii can absolutely help us as can um, Island Energy to take some of that fuel and put it above ground. While as acting governor, within minutes, my team came up with a plan and partnership to work with some of these other folks here that can make it possible for us to move the fuel above the ground, above the aquifer. That was on December 2nd. I do appreciate the, the uh, congressman coming around two months later and proposing a bill. That came seven years after I proposed this bill, which was Senate Bill 1168 where I asked that we, relating to underground storage with, in that case, it was with Senator Gabbard, that we really regulate the heck out of this and get that fuel above ground uh, if they can't manage it. So we've been working on this for years, but the Navy fairly pushes back some, and that's, that's a, a historic challenge. We want them as partners. We want them as family in our, in our islands, in our state, but they have to be really part of the Ohana. And that means removing the fuel from underground because at this point, if the fuel continues to leak or if there are other spills, not only will it compromise clean water for our, our keiki, but also it will make it impossible for us to build because we won't be able to get new water meters, which means we can't get more houses built, which means we can't get the affordability down like Ryan uh, alluded to with his earlier question. We won't be able to have hotels be open because we'll have to curb, uh, curtail water, or curb water use in the summertime when many people travel here. That would devastate our economy and cost us jobs. So this is an existential question, which is why there can be no compromise on moving the fuel above ground. There are considerations for national security. I'm not sure it was prudent to hold a press conference. I think it would probably have been better just to solve the problem because we are dealing with some serious concerns overseas. But I will say this, I will never waver on bringing that fuel above ground. I would not allow for additional permits. This has to be solved. And just to expand a little on that, I think that there still is a lot of frustration in the community because we are hearing, uh, you know, this this outcry from public officials from a variety of levels, all the way from congressional delegation uh, to the, you know, city council members are also upset about this. And yet uh, there remains a lot of families who continue to live in Waikiki. They're not able to have access to their homes because of the water issues there. And and just, you know, the, their lives have been turned upside down. 
Uh, how do we support these families right now? I mean, there seems to be a lot of opposition, but there just seems to be not a lot of movement when it comes to getting this resolved for these families who have been displaced. Yes. So the immediate solution is to provide the clean water directly. And that means filtration of the water without hesitation. My team's already contacted, and this is going to take some time, uh, major technology companies to deal with desalinization. We've had talks with Ernie Lau and his team on this matter with uh, foreign governments that do this kind of work. The Israelis are actually very good on clean water technology. So we've already begun that process because I'm not waiting to serve as governor. I'm actually dealing with these things right now, but that's going to take time. The Navy will have to uh, make good all of their promises and commitments, I guess, for immediate survival for the families that were in the, you know, in the harm's way. You know, when, when serving as acting gov, we didn't just go see admirals and generals. We went and sat with eight families to talk to them about what it meant for their kids who one child was having extra seizures, another child didn't have her medications, another kid was having difficulty with swallowing. And that was just in the first 72 hours after the you know, the contamination. So as a doctor, I'm going to be poised to deal with this, uh, hopefully well. Uh, but there can be no compromise on this matter. None, none at all. Do you think that the Navy is a trustworthy partner in this, given everything that's gone on in the last two, three months? Uh, they'll have to prove it through action. That's what they'll have to do. You know, our time here is almost done, but I, I did want to just kind of circle back to COVID-19 before we move on and, and, and again, just get a little more clarification. Um, when you say that we could be sunsetting Safe Travels program, I mean, is this going to be something that's going to be a phase thing? Is Would this just be all at once, everything maybe disappeared? And, and what about the international visitors that also come in uh, and those requirements that may be required for them? How, how do you see this kind of uh, unfolding as we look to maybe sunset this program? I'm glad you asked for clarity. So uh, for international travel, travel, that's going to be a federal designation and it remains one. Uh, and they modeled their program after safe travels, ironically. So that's a feather in the cap of General Hara and our whole team, Libby Char and everyone who worked on that. So we're happy about that. But that'll be a federal decision. As far as state travel, uh, safe travel, sunsetting and the city and county rules sunsetting. Uh, let's make sure that we get below that threshold of 100 cases per day. Let's make sure that things are very uh, well contained and safe and we'll still err on the side of caution otherwise you know there are probably people um, punching away at their keys uh, saying wait don't go so fast but it's been a year and a half of safe travels as of april 15th so that's a long time and i think people are very ready in general as long as we can keep it controlled so i would not be surprised at all if around on or around the 17th of april that some of these rules sunset because that's when we lose a lot of the resources and our case counts. If the current trajectory is any indication, will be really super low. And then after that, I would say sometime maybe around April 1st, we'll have to see what the governor says. That's when he'll begin probably to follow the guidance of some of these other states like California, New York, most of them, frankly, where they begin to get rid of mask mandates with the exception of individuals who are very vulnerable. Uh, but we'll use health guidance then. And I can tell you as a physician, health guidance is really the way we've always dealt with these crises. Only this one was so large that it required statewide rules and regulations uh, and emergency proclamations because it, we were all so vulnerable. But it will be good to get back toward normal. It will be good to have uh, kind of a renewal period. And we're gonna need a whole lot of renewal. We have to renew after the corruption scandal. We have to renew after uh, a lot of inaction on some issues like Red Hill that we've been concerned about. And we have to renew after COVID because so much has changed for people that as human nature goes, we have to be able to get back toward what we love most, which is being with people. We've seen some of that. We're coming down with our cases and you know, I'm with people a lot and I can tell that they're ready, but we still wanna do it safely. Now, I just wanna say, you did say April 17th. I think you meant March 17th to sunset, is that right? Forgive me, yes, March 17th. Yes, thank you. March 17th, when we lose much of the federal support, followed by April 1st when that resource actually goes away. Uh, but we'll still be mindful. We'll still be watching the cases that do come in. We'll do genetic analysis to make sure no new variant is causing trouble. We'll be watching what goes on in other countries. And we'll do that long after any restrictions go away. Uh, just because we're not on together, perhaps on Spotlight or other news networks talking about COVID every day, you can be sure that come three or four in the morning, I'll be looking out over America and Europe to see what's going on with COVID to make sure we're safe.
And with the masks, then would the mask sunset at this at a sit in a similar sort of timeline, or do you think that that would come later? My guess is it'll come two to four weeks later, uh, based on the way the director of health and the governor have uh, handled this challenge. They want to do that last. That was a conversation we had today, uh, because usually you don't want to change all of your variables all at once, because then you don't know what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, our analytic approach has been the reason that we've had the lowest case counts or second lowest case counts in the country and the lowest mortality rate. It's been analytics and that's what helped guide us to bring in the 745 extra nurses right now. That made a big difference. I can tell you from firsthand experience that made a big difference to keep our healthcare system intact. So analytics always guide, uh, guide the day. That's the best way to do it. And we should apply that to housing and cost of living and all these other issues. If we're better with our analytics, we can actually take care of people better. But at the end of the day, people are going to have to have leaders they can trust. And if they don't trust the government, then it's difficult to expect people to work with us to deal with some of these challenges. And I hope to restore some of that trust, at least for my part. All right, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, thank you so much for starting off the week with us and uh, giving us an update not only on COVID-19, but also on your candidacy for governor. We appreciate uh, the, your time here this morning. Thanks so much. Hey, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you. Well, very interesting to hear about, uh, let's talk about those COVID restrictions potentially dropping first. Uh, we could be seeing, as he said, the federal support going away. We will be seeing the federal support going away. And with that, we could also see the sunsetting of safe travels. And it's interesting, Ryan, just what you were saying, that just a few weeks ago, we were talking about the very likely possibility that we would have booster requirements added to a number of things. Uh, you know, safe access to Oahu, potentially safe travels was very, very seriously being considered. And now now we have gone in a totally different direction. Yeah, the Lieutenant Governor is saying that we will be following what other states are doing in dropping some of those restrictions, uh, which will include Safe Travels Hawaii, a uh, program that he has helped to start up uh, that, of course, required all, all those restrictions for those entering the state. Uh, we also heard about just there at the end, uh, talking about the timeline for mask mandates, saying that will likely come sometime after the restrictions are dropped for uh, the vaccine verifications and for safe travels. Uh, so a lot of things, uh, you know, I think for some people might be a little shocking to hear, uh, again, for that quick turnaround of what we heard was maybe potentially happening with boosters to where we're at now. But the lieutenant governor confident in our case counts and the uh, hospital capacity at this point to be able to make that announcement. Yeah, also saying that he is not in favor of having Red Hill fuel storage facility operate in any capacity, saying that the tanks must be brought above ground, uh, that there is, there's really no wiggle room on that. And of course, outlining some of his ambitions for governor. Uh, as you said, it's no secret that he's been running for some time, but he made it official last week. And so we wanted to ask him about that. Uh, he's drawing a distinction between himself and the other candidates, including uh, Kai Kahele, who is not running at this point, but has been sort of flirting with the idea publicly. Uh, and so we had to ask him about that. But he says that he's focused on distinguishing himself, focused on his experience as a doctor and uh, his time in office. And so it'll be an interesting next few months. And we encourage people who may be tuning in or who may have missed our other conversations with those candidates to also Go back and watch. We have done interviews with all those candidates, uh, including Vicky Cayetano, Kirk Caldwell. And last week we spoke to Congressman Kai Kahele about their thoughts. Uh, so I know there's some discussion out there that we are giving this platform to the lieutenant governor. But we have also given this platform and this opportunity for other candidates to also express uh, where they stand on some of the issues that we spoke about this morning as well. Uh, on Wednesday, we will be switching gears and focusing solely on COVID-19 and the impact here in our community. Well, actually, we are not. Oh, we had not. a guest change. We did. <laughs> we My had apologies. a little guest change. We are going to be focusing on Mahina Olelo Hawaii. That, of course, is February is Hawaiian Language Month. We will be talking to two people who are doing their best to perpetuate Hawaiian language, uh, not only here in Hawaii, but around the world. These are two leaders in our community who have taken on the mantle of uh you know, supporting Hawaiian language and bringing it to the masses. There's some really cool things happening in that space. And so we're going to be devoting Wednesday's show to that. Yeah, we thank you so much for being a part of this conversation uh, and encourage you if you've missed any of these past episodes uh, or would like to go back and watch it again, uh, you can find it online or where podcasts are available. Until Wednesday, have a great Valentine's Day. We'll see you back here at 1030 then. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs and Beachside Roofing.